So it turns out there are a lot of different ways you can waste money on AI. I was personally burning between $300 and $500 a month before I actually figured out what works. And after making many, many painful mistakes myself, I realized that it boiled down to three different buckets that people run into. So it's how they're using AI, how they're implementing AI for their business, and then how they're vibe coding with AI. So whether you're using ChatGPT, trying to automate your business, or building applications with AI, I wanna share with you the painful lessons I've experienced so you can get past those expensive trial and errors. So let's avoid wasting money on AI together and dive in. Okie dokie. So these are the three main areas where I've wasted money and I've seen people waste money. So the first one here is using AI. So this can be broken into two categories. So either it's going to be somebody that's using ChatGPT or somebody that's going to buy access to AI. So this could be a business buying access to an AI startup for them to automate something. A lot, of, a lot of money wasted in both of these areas. The second one is going to be implementing AI. So this is somebody that wants to implement AI into their business to automate stuff internally, or somebody wants to implement this into their product to then uh, increase the customer experience. Two categories, again, where money is wasted. Finally, vibe coding. A lot of money is wasted here, especially if done incorrectly. So those are the three categories. We'll start with the first one, which is using AI. Now, this is going to be from the consumer perspective. So somebody that's using AI as a user of ChatGPT. So on the left-hand side, we'll start here. The first thing I see a lot of people mess up is they're not, they're not making use of the tool as they should. It's often when somebody, and the analogy I saw that I appreciated is say that somebody buys an iPhone and when they buy the iPhone, they only use the flashlight and nothing else. There's so many more things they could get from the iPhone, but they only use the flashlight. So this is what I'm seeing people use when they pay for a subscription. So they could do the $20. I even seen people have $200 subscriptions where they're wasting tons of money and only getting a little value from these tools. So the trick here is to spend at least 20 minutes, it's not a lot, 20 minutes a week, learning either new prompting techniques to get more out of the AI or understanding new features that that specific tool you're using has released because oftentimes these providers, they release new features every month, every week, et cetera. Keep up with that, understand what's being released and understand how that applies to your use case. And that's the most important part here is application. So once you've learned something, then you need to apply those learnings. Don't just understand that there's a new prompt feature, but apply that prompt to what you care about. And the best way I can do this, or I recommend doing this, is you have three to five high quality use cases that matter to you. Matter to you. So if I've automated one of these three or five, I'm going to get 30 to 50% of my time back in my day based off the work that I do. You should have this on a short list. So anytime that a new feature comes out or a new prompting technique comes out that you see, you should apply that directly to that short list of value use cases that you have if that helps, then that's a great bonus for you. And you wanna keep doing this over and over. So find the things that matter, apply those to the use cases you care about, and then you know get a lot of time back in your life. So that's the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we're going to have the free approach. So there's probably many different tools you could subscribe to, but I recommend not subscribing to all of them because many of them have very generous free tiers where it may give you access to a variety of things you don't necessarily need access to all the time, but you can get just enough access to get the use case that you care about. For example, I don't subscribe to Grok, but I use it for two primary use cases that are specific to that model. One is it has direct access to X. So if I need access to new information that's happening around AI, I often go to Grok to ask about that. Another thing is Grok and DeepSeek both are willing to have conversations around topics that are maybe politically incorrect or on the outskirts of what's acceptable for an AI model to talk about if you're talking about ChatGPT or Anthropic. So that's another great place to go for that free access. Another really good one is Gemini 2.5 Pro. So Gemini 2.5 Pro has a free tier inside of AI Studio. Just if you just go to their AI Studio, sign up, you'll get a extremely generous free tier. I use this a lot and I never get taxed for it, which is awesome. Taxed, priced, whatever. Um, and with this, I use it for a variety of use cases. One is debugging. So if I have a gnarly bug that I need to solve, I'll go to GPT-5 Pro to help me with that. Another one is preparation for coding. So it can help create really lengthy and detailed documents. And lastly, it processes massive files really well. So if you have audio and video, this is a great place to go to get that process, to get the transcript or something else. And this is going to be, again, completely free. And these are just a few. So this is mixing and matching a variety of models that are free and paid, figuring out where you want to spend your money and where you can get the free use cases that are not as frequent for you, but still matter and you can get free access. Oh, hello there. So this video is brought to you by me. Below is a link to a 30 day AI insight series. We've got 30 days of 30 insights in your inbox for completely free. It's 30 insights of how you can apply AI to your business and your work. If that's at all interesting to you, check out the link. With that being said, let's dive back into the video. And on top of all of this, I wanted to share a few different deep dives at the end. So or kind of throughout the presentation. So the first thing here is I put out a video probably a week ago or two weeks ago by now, 
that you can get insights into how to use ChatGPT 5 more effectively if you have access to it today, which most of you probably do. So if you do, I'd recommend watching this video, learning the techniques, and then applying those to the use cases on that short list that I mentioned, that three to five that matter to you. All right, so next is going to be if you're buying access to AI. So if there's an AI startup that's pitching itself to you that is saying, I'm gonna automate everything and you're gonna live a life of uh, luxury, then you should validate that that's true. And the best way to do this is having evaluation criteria. But first you need to have a goal. So when you obviously buy an AI product from a company, you have an intent of that purchase. So you're saying, this is going to achieve X problem or, it's, or solve X problem, whatever else. And when you have that intent, you then need to establish what the evaluation criteria is for you achieving that goal. And when setting these evaluation criteria, they should be binary, not on a spectrum. So oftentimes what I see people do when they have evaluation criteria, it's on a spectrum of saying, oh, okay, it's between one and 10 of quality or between A through F or something else. But the issue with this is it's hard to debate what's the difference between a three and a four or a seven and an eight. Now, oftentimes people don't really know. So the trick here is to have binary evals that are very clear, measurable, and actionable. And here's just a little example I wanna give you. So here we have an AI sales rep that's really good at cold calling for outbound. And now here are three example uh, criteria that are binary. So the first one, probably the most important, is is this AI able to book a meeting afterwards with a human uh, sales rep to then close this lead? That's probably one of the most important binary evals. Another one is does the AI find a, a true pain point with the consumer when they're having the conversation? You can, you can extract that from transcripts probably with another AI. And then lastly is does the call end in 60 seconds or less? If it ends in 60 seconds or less, there's a good chance that the person probably doesn't want to listen to the AI because they know that it's an AI or the AI is coming off in an aggressive or nonchalant way. So if that's true, you need to review the AI, the prompt associated to it and improve that. These are just a few binary evals that you'd like to probably have 10 to 15 of these that you're tracking consistently over the trial period. Because all of these AI startups and all these AI companies, they usually give you a trial period of 30 to 60 to 90 days. In that time frame, you should be ensuring that these evals are passing consistently and improving so you know you're going to actually get the value from this tool that you're buying. And in turn, not wasting money. So the next one here is implementing AI. So if I'm going to implement AI into my business, the first thing I would recommend for anybody is to lower the risk. And the way you can lower the risk is you have two options. You can auto automate stuff internally, or you can put this into your product. The low risk approach here to start is automating your business. And then once you've learned the lessons of how to implement AI effectively, then and only then do you put this inside of your product because your product is connected to your brand and is connected to the consumer experience that you're getting paid for. And when trying to figure out where to automate your AI when you're going through this process is I'd recommend using a kind of a discovery process I do for my clients. And the first thing you wanna do is you wanna identify what's the priority goal for the business in the next 12 to 18 months. Once you've identified what that priority goal is for the next 12 to 18 months, then from that you wanna figure out what are the blockers between where you are now, where you want to be in that next 12 to 18 months. And once you've identified the blockers, you rank prioritize that into a list then you map out the activities from there. Again, I have a deep dive on this. So if you're interested in understanding how to figure out where to automate inside of your business to start, I created this video that walks you through that exact funnel. It gives you an idea of where to start and the different process that I walk my clients through. Now on to implementing AI and one of the hardest lessons I've learned that costed plenty of money, which is not starting big. So the, the trick here is when you're implementing AI into your business and or a product, you start with the biggest model you can find and then go small. The reason you start big and go small is you wanna start with a state-of-the-art model. So this is going to be a big, expensive model that's very intelligent to prove to yourself that what you're trying to automate is automatable. So AI can do this. And if AI can do it, and you've proved it with the AI that's the biggest and the baddest, then and only then do you go down to a smaller model and optimize that prompt inside to ensure that it's working effectively. And oftentimes when you're going to a smaller model, you'll likely have to chunk up that prompt into smaller chunks. So say that this big bad model here, you only need one model and one prompt for it to achieve the task. But for the smaller model, you may have to chunk that task into three different separate subtasks and three separate sub prompts and each micro model is going to achieve that task, string them all together, and then out pops your output. When doing this, you're likely going to get a lot faster response from all these small models. It's going to be a lot cheaper, and surprisingly, it's going to be more reliable than the big model. So if you do this process when implementing AI into your business or product, you're going to save yourself a lot of time and a lot of frustration, which in turn equates to money. All right, so now onto a third item for implementing AI, which is trust AI. So this again is a hard lesson I've learned, and I wanna tell you a story about this. 
So I worked with a construction company that was a subcontracting company, and they wanted to basically convert hundreds and thousands of PDFs into a searchable database so they could easily grab data from the PDFs and then put it into a proposal. Now, when I started out with this process, I was on the left-hand side. I completely over-engineered this because I didn't have trust in the AI. I thought it would be unreliable. So I created a bunch of things called regexes, which is basically search terms and static searches for text. I created a bunch of parsers to pull out data, created a bunch of additional post-processing scripts. And by the end, I had probably between 25 and 30,000 lines of code to achieve this task. In the end, sadly, all of this complexity only got me a 70%, 76% accuracy rate of pulling the data, the data out correctly. It was extremely slow and it was pretty cost prohibitive because I was using multiple models to do this processing. At the end of this, I was like, all right, well, this is not going to meet the expectations of the client. So we scrapped the entire thing. Once I scrapped the entire thing, we actually trusted AI more. We outsourced most of it to AI. I ripped out a bunch of the code and we really probably removed 80% of the code and we were down to maybe a few hundred lines of code. We outsourced everything to one very prominent model, gave it a very strong prompt. And after all of that process, we got 98% accuracy. It was probably three times faster and probably five times cheaper, which seems crazy. But the moral of the story here, to avoid wasting money like I did by over-engineering things, is first try to outsource as much as you can to AI and trust the fact that the AI may be able to do this task more effectively than you think it would and keep testing it over time. Because as these models advance, and they will every single month, you need to test and validate that you're not wasting money on an outdated or archaic focus of over-engineered things when you could just outsource most of it to AI. All right, so now on to vibe coding. So this is probably a, one of the big areas that I see a lot of people make mistakes when they're vibing with AI to build applications is they don't spend enough time on preparation. So as Abraham Lincoln once said, if I had six hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend four hours sharpening the ax and then two hours actually chopping down the tree. And that's exactly what we should do when we're vibe coding is we should sharpen axes and chop down the trees. No, we should spend 60 to 70% of our time preparing the AI before we code anything. And how does this manifest? Well, there's two primary things I mentioned people do, or I say I recommend people do, is define requirements. So defining requirements, how does this manifest? You have a specification that covers what you want to build. That's a W. You have a blueprint that covers how you want to go about building it. And then finally, you have a to-do list that acts as a roadmap for the AI to then follow. These three documents here, are going to be the guiding light of our AI to then move effectively in the world to build the thing we need it to do. But we need to ensure that every single one of these documents have all the information they need before we move forward with anything. And the best way to do this is to first start with research. Because oftentimes, as you probably know, this line here, let's say this line here is time. As time moves on, we eventually checkpoint this AI. So if I'm OpenAI or Anthropic or Google or whoever else, I'm going to train the model to a point. Once I've trained it to a point, I'm going to cut off the training and I'm then going to give it out to the world to use. Everybody that's using it here, if maybe new API documentation is released here, the AI doesn't have this knowledge base because it was cut off at this time point. So for us, it's important for us to do research and understand what's the updated API documentation that we need for the thing we're trying to build. And we then add this to our document, either the blueprint or the spec, to ensure that when it is building on our behalf, it references this updated documentation and builds the right thing the first time. If you don't do this, you're likely going to have a lot of frustration, waste a lot of money and time because you're building in circles, the AI is writing the wrong code and giving you way too many errors, and it's basically eating its own tail and running in circles. But if done correctly, and you prepare correctly, you'll be able to chop down the tree, have a great time, vibe with AI, build features, and test and iterate. So prepare, don't wait. And, oh, here we go. So another deep dive. So I've created this video a while back, so this is slightly outdated. The, the models that are referenced here are older, but the process itself still stands. So the thing that I just mentioned, the spec, the blueprint, and the to-dos, those three documents are all discussed in this video in depth on how do I how do I build them and how to go about that process. So I recommend if you're interested, watch that video. All right, so now on to another good one for vibing. So we'll first start on the left-hand side with fresh combos. So with vibing, this is one of the best practices, and this is kind of the lesson I want to take away here. So if you apply best practices when vibe coding, you're going to save yourself a lot of money and time and frustration. So the first one is starting as many fresh conversations as possible with AI. Reason being is that the context window for an AI, when it fills up, its intelligence degrades. So if this is the context window for an AI, once you get to maybe like 80%, the AI's intelligence is going to drop like a rock, and it's not going to effectively build what you need it to build. So if you start fresh conversations often, you're resetting that context window to basically zero or close to zero, which means the AI's ability to achieve a task is increased dramatically by every fresh conversation you start. 
So anytime you build a new feature, run a new test, build a new micro feature, et cetera, start a fresh conversation and lead it with the documents I mentioned previously. This avoids the, de the degradation of the AI's intelligence. So that's the first lesson. The next lesson is not overcomplicating things. So oftentimes I see a lot of people, they overcomplicate stuff when they're vibing with AI. I was having a conversation with a buddy last week and he was telling, about, telling me about all these new starter kits and these this scaffolding and running multiple agents in parallel and doing all this complex stuff to build his applications. And he realized that when doing all of this, he was running in circles and he was making it more difficult for himself to build these applications because it was making it more difficult for the AI to know what to do. And that's what people don't realize is when you adopt all these new tools that are being dropped on X or GitHub or whatever else, you're overcomplicating the process for the AI to achieve its goal. You're getting in the way, you're not helping it. And that's where most people sit right here. They're adding all this complexity when in turn, they should just ask the AI what to do with a little bit of guidance and a surgical way of calling tools that the AI is already trained on, which is likely basic terminal tools that are in the terminal itself. So the moral of the story of this best practice is keep things simple as much as possible. Don't overcomplicate stuff. Just give it gui guidance on wh which, which direction you want to go based off the documents you created. And then allow the AI to use the tools that it likely already knows how to use in the terminal without your cool, fancy starter kits and uh, taskmasters and all the other things and running too many agents in parallel. And those are the ways to not waste money or waste or not to waste money like I wasted money. So the first one here is when you're using AI, if you're using it like a consumer, such as ChatGPT, et cetera, make sure you're learning at least 20 minutes a week and taking those learnings and apply them to the use cases that you care about. After that, use a lot of the free tools that are available because there's a lot of things that are being generously free today because they're being subsidized by massive VCs or tech companies. And then the other one is if you're a company that's buying AI products for, from a startup or somebody else, have high quality evaluation criteria that's binary, that's aligned with the goal that you care about for the product of why you purchased it. Next one here is implementation. So if you're implementing AI into your business for either a product or automation, start with a low risk task, which is likely going to be an internal automation. Once you've learned how to implement AI effectively, then you can go external because that's where your brand and your consumer experience is at risk. In addition to that, you when, when implementing anything, start with the big model, make sure what you're doing is achievable by AI. Once you've uh, confirmed that, then you can go to a smaller AI to then save money and time. And then lastly, trust AI. So put more trust in AI than I did. Don't over, over, over engineer things, don't over complicate things. Just see if AI can do it by itself with the minimal assistance with prompts and a little bit of scaffolding. Most of the time it'll be able to do it for you if it's a reasonable task. And finally, when you're vibing with AI, Make sure you spend most of your time preparing documentation and preparing your AI before you start coding. Start fresh conversations constantly, probably to a, like an annoying degree for yourself, but you're knowing that you're going to reset the context to increase the AI's ability to achieve the task. And then finally, stay simple. Don't add a bunch of multiple agents running in parallel, you know, all this scaffolding and starter kits, et cetera. Just keep it simple, give guidance, let the AI do its thing, and it's likely going to do what it needs to do much faster without you getting in the way. And that's it. So if you enjoyed this, reshare it with your friends. As I mentioned previously, below is a free link to the 30-day AI Insight series. We've got 30 days of 30 insights in your inbox of how you can apply AI to your business and your work. So if that's interesting, check out the link below. And while you're down there, there's also another link where you can work with me. So if there's a good fit between the two of us, feel free to check that out as well. With that being said, internet, I'll see you next time.